Good morning. It is so good to have each of you here with us this morning as we continue in our study in the book of Genesis. So if you've got your Bible handy, if you want to open it up to Genesis chapter 18, we're going to begin in verse number 16 in just a few moments. Uh, but first, we want to open with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for your scriptures that you've given us as a guide to life and to living. Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts through this passage that we're going to look at today that speaks true to us and how it is so beneficial to each and every human being on this earth to live according to your righteous standards. And that in not doing so, it leads to pain and suffering in this world upon ourselves and upon all, all those around us. And Lord, help us to understand this timeless truth that we're going to look at in these ancient texts that we'll look at this morning. Guide our hearts, Lord. Help us to understand these truths. Help us to see these truths being played out in our day today. Lord, it's in your great name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Every society that the world has ever formed has learned the hard way the godly moral absolutes are essential for consistent stability within and long-term survival. We see this not only in the scripture, but also in world history. From ancient world history to modern day world history, we see this timeless truth. Those godly moral absolutes must be taught in the home and required practice by the parents given to the children, generation by generation, or else the society is doomed to collapse. I want to show you just a couple of things on a map really closely, but really quickly before we get started. Uh, as we studied earlier in our study, uh, there was a day when when God had, or, or, I'm sorry, where where God, but but also uh, where Abraham had taken under God's guidance, Lot, his nephew, up to a mountaintop between Bethel and Ai, right about here where my pointer is. And from this mountaintop, Abraham had told Lot, you look around the land. They could see from there he they could see all around, almost they could see all almost all of Canaan and all of the lands all on either side of the Jordan River from Canaan, and then also the lands in the Transjordan also. And, and Abraham said, Lot, you pick the land that you want to take. You take your people and your herds there, and I'll take whatever you don't choose. And so Lot looked around, and he looked south of Ai, of that peak between Ai and Bethel, and he saw what the Bible calls the plain of the Jordan. The Jordan River runs south from the, what is called was called the Sea of Kinnereth, called the Sea of Galilee in the New Testament, all the way south, and in the New Testament runs into the Dead Sea. See it right here. Okay. Now, apparently, the Dead Sea wasn't the Dead Sea at this particular time, because what Lot saw when he looked down there was what he called the 
plain of the Valley of Sidim. The Jordan River still ran down here, but what it was producing was in the what is now the northern part of the Dead Sea was a clean freshwater lake. And then that freshwater lake ran next and the Jordan River emptied into a valley in a plain, you know, that ran through a plain on down to the south. And that valley was called the Valley of Sidim that ran south out of what is now the south end of the Dead Sea. But this plain is what is Lot what Lot chose because it was so rich and fertile and green such that he he compared it to the garden of eden in how green and fertile it was okay and so that is the what he chose and because of the fact that he chose the transjordan and and this area down here in the area of the plain abram took the land of Canaan on the west side of the Jordan River and what would later become the Dead Sea, and that became the land of Abraham. And so things begin to go from there. Okay, I told you where, where the Valley of Sidim is, is runs down in this southern end of what is now the what is now the uh southern end of the Dead Sea, but then was a, a valley that was created by the Jordan River as it ran through this higher, higher elevation plain that ran right through this area on the south side of that freshwater lake that was in the north here. Okay, I'll show you some a map of that in just a minute. But Abram and and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah, they lived in a place called Mamre, which is right here where my pointer is, that was just outside of Hebron. Okay. And without the Dead Sea being in between, it was a very short trip to go from Mamre straight across over to Sodom, where Lot began to live okay so i i just wanted you to see that on the map before we get into the rest of the story so let's step on into the rest of the story lot's father haran before abraham and sarah and his family had all moved away from haran to canaan lot's father who's just coincidentally, is named after that land they were living in, Haran. He had died when, when Lot was very young. And since Abraham was Lot's uncle, and, he, and since Abraham and Sarah had no children, they took Lot into their home as their adopted son. And they raised Lot up. So Lot was like a son to Abraham and Lot, I mean, Abraham and Sarah. In Genesis 13, 10 through 12, in Canaan, since Lot had chosen to live in the rich plain of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, as, as we start today's story, that's where, that's where Lot is living. Okay, Even at the time of Lot's choice, these two cities we see in Genesis 13, 13, were known for their immoral practices, but especially for their immoral sexual practices. Now, here's a picture drawn by geologists of what this must have looked like in the day. Okay, this area that is now the northern part of the Dead Sea was actually a freshwater lake. The Jordan River ran into it, filled this freshwater lake, and then the Jordan River ran out of it and across this very fertile, high elevation plain, and then out of the plain 
on down to the Gulf of Aqaba. As it ran across this plain, there was a valley that it ran through on the plain that was called the Valley of Sidon. Sodom and Gomorrah and some other cities were in, located in this plain. Sodom is believed to have been on the southern part of this plain. Hebron is right over about where my pointer is. See my pointer right over here. So to get to Sodom, all Abraham would have had to do is just travel straight across here. It's a little long one day walk to get from Hebron to Sodom. Okay, so you can do it in a day. You had to go at a pretty good pace, but you could do it in a day. Okay, now, both the cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, were located in the valley of Sidon. And what is marked Dead Sea on the map here is likely at the time to be a large freshwater lake, okay, with the Jordan River flowing out of the south end of the lake through the plain on down all the way to the Gulf of Aqaba, which I've already told you. Regarding the locations of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, John Walton, who is a, a, a much more studied expert on Genesis and its geography than I am, he says, Sodom and Gomorrah have stood throughout history as an example of wickedness and divine judgment. How strange it is then that there is little recollection of the location of these cities of the plain. Their association with Zoar or Zoara, as we found in a 6th century AD Madaba map, and the bitumen pits of the Valley of Sidim, as we see recorded in Genesis 14.10, both point to the southern end of the Dead Sea, down in this area, arguments for their identification with the north end of the Dead Sea up in this area are based on the distance to travel from Hebron, which is 18 miles from Hebron to the north end as compared to 40 miles to the southern location. And the mention of the plain of Jordan in Genesis 13, 10 through 12. The southern location enjoys a stronger biblical support as well as the support of the earliest extra biblical traditions. All right, so now let's pick up where we left off last week in, in Genesis 18, 16. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you along there as, as we come in. It says, so the men arose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on their way. Now, when following their meal and their conversation with Abraham and Sarah, the Lord God in human flesh and blood, so this is probably a Christophany, okay, at least a theophany. If you don't want to believe that this is, is a Christophany, you can, you've got to admit it's a theophany. It's God in flesh and blood talking to Abraham. He's, a, he's, associate, he's accompanied by two angels who look just like men, okay, such that unless you see something else that gives you another indication. Everybody who's going to encounter them from here on in the story is just going to think they're regular men. They look just like men from Canaan, from the area. They get no other indication otherwise unless they do something that gives them another idea. Okay. And when God told them this, this meeting that they rose from here in verse 16 was the meeting where God had told Abraham, and Sarah, that within one year, they were going to have a son, and they were going to name him Isaac. Okay, so following their meal, 
uh, the Lord and the two angels rose from rose from where they were and looked toward Sodom. Okay, they had business in Sodom. Okay, and Abram went with the Lord and the two angels and sent them on their way, as was common courtesy of the day. You, would, you had guests, you would walk them part of the way along their trip as they left, and then at some point you would turn around and come back home. Okay, that was common courtesy of the day. So 17 through 19, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abra Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord and do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Now, Abraham most likely knew about the terribly sinful reputations of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. We'd seen them mentioned, as I pointed out to you, or much earlier in Genesis in chapters 13 and 14, uh, about the time that Abraham first came to Canaan, that reputation was already there. When Abraham, when Abraham heard God say all this, his focus on his promised son Isaac must have been interrupted with a curiosity regarding the Lord's references to doing his righteousness and justice with respect to especially Sodom. He, he had family there. His nephew Lot, who was his adopted son, essentially, along with all the members of Lot's household, lived in Sodom. Abraham was humble enough in his this privileged situation not to jump in and voice his opinion until the time was right for him to speak personally with the Lord. Okay, he's going to wait till the angels aren't around there so he can have a private conversation with the Lord. In verse, God, God's announcement in last week's lesson of Isaac's birth demonstrated to Abraham and to Sarah that God always fulfills his covenant promises. But in his ways and in his timing, but in a larger sense, this demonstration validates the dependability of God's word in every sphere of life across the world, not just in Canaan, not just in Israel, not in just the United States of America, but in every place in the world and in every day and every age of human history. Let's step on down to verses 21 and 20 and 21. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah were the two prominent cities on the plain of the Jordan River. So that area that marked the plain on that map that I just showed you, the two prominent biggest cities are Sodom and Gomorrah. They're mentioned in Genesis 13, 10, and then in Genesis 14, 2 through 3, and verse 8, we're told that also on that plain were equally simple but smaller cities named Adma. Zeboim, and a, a, two cities that were very close to each other, paired together, a larger city named Bela, B-E-L-A, and Zoar, Z-O-A-R. Okay, the Hebrew word rendered very grave here in this, the, I've got it underlined there in that verse number 20, or as it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible, extremely serious is a derivative of a verb that means to be extremely heavy or 
in in severity and magnitude. And we're going to see it again. Well, I'm sorry, we just saw it. No, I'm, I'm sorry, we're going to see it again in Genesis 19, 3 and 9. Okay, this, this, this adjective that comes from a Hebrew verb, that it's got action associated with it. It means it translates translated very grave or very serious, and that and it has action tied to it. In other words, there's going to be negative results because of this very grave or very serious thing that is going on. Okay, there, there the sexual perversions that were going on in Sodom and Gomorrah and these other five cities were expressive of the depravity that characterized citizens in these two cities. Okay. Let's come down to verse 22. Then the men turned away from there. Okay. The two angels left and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Abraham no longer expect, expressed, no longer being like he was doing in the earlier parts of Genesis, especially since Genesis 12, he was he was he no longer expressed the frustration and concern about his own future that he once showed in God's presence. Okay, he's gotten a little older and more mature, and he's seen more things that fulfilled God's truth in his life. And Abraham's faith had grown, and his Abraham's practice of his faith had transformed him and changed him and matured him. Now he stood deferential and reverent and submissive to the Lord, ready to serve him in any capacity according to the Lord's desires and plans. Okay, so, so he's a, a more mature guy, but now he's concerned because of what God may be planning with respect to Sodom, where Lot, his nephew, lives. He loves Lot like a son. Okay. And so he's concerned. And he wants to he wants to intercede to God for his his nephew Lot, whom he loves very much. Let's come down to verse 23. And Abraham came near and said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for 50 righteous who were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay, slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as wicked? Far be it from you. And so... Then Abraham did something incredibly bold. He stood before God and he pled for the city of Sodom. He asked God to pardon the right the, the people who were unrighteous and spare them from destruction on the on the basis of those who were righteous who were there. Abraham's motive seems to have been twofold. Number one, his intercession sought to prevent the total annihilation of the city's population. Abraham, Abraham could not conceive that every single person living in Sodom and Gomorrah, they were big cities, he could not conceive that they practiced wickedness deserving destruction across the board, that there wasn't one single righteous person in either city. And number two, Abraham aspired to know the Lord better. He, he moved, you see, he moved closer to God before speaking. The simple gesture signaled his desire to clarify his own lack of understanding at God's pronouncement. The total extermination of the region's population collided with his belief in God's justice. 
He knew that God does not punish the innocent for the sins of the guilty. God knows how many righteous people are living in Sodom. Abraham did not. Abraham was only assuming that, that God considered even his nephew Lot righteous enough to say. Uh, Abraham had not seen too much of his Lot, of, of, of his nephew Lot in, in quite a while. He didn't know if Lot had changed. God had previously told Abraham that it, it was his personal belief in God and his walk of faith in God that was accounted to him as righteousness. It wasn't even for Abraham the good works that he did that saved him. It was his belief in God and his walk of faith in God that saved him. That's what was accounted to him as righteousness by God. The only hope, the way that Abraham saw it, for Sodom and Gomorrah to be spared was finding someone who was righteous, who had not turned away and rejected God and was instead living each day by belief and faith in God, like Abraham, or at least someone close to that. But who could stand in the gap and claim the perfection that was necessary to satisfy the perfectly holy God? That was the question. Well, God had made some promises down through history, all the way going all the way back to Adam and Eve, right after they had sinned. God said, I will put enmity or strife or struggle or battle between you, meaning Satan, and the woman, and between your seed, those who follow you, and those who and her seed, those who follow one who is coming after her, who will be that one who will be the one who people could trust in and who would be righteous and acceptable to God in, in his righteousness. God says, that one will bruise Satan's head, your head, and you shall bruise his heel, and Satan shall bruise his heel. That was the first promise. And so people could look forward to this one that's going to come be born of a woman. They don't know which woman or who the father's going to be, but there's one who's coming who's going to break the enmity between God and man that's created by personal sin, that people needed that person. They wanted that person. They hated the enmity. They hated the struggle that was caused by sin. Okay. And then in Genesis 12, 3, it's recorded that God had said to Abraham, he said to Abraham, in your seed, it'll be in your seed that all the families of the earth shall be blessed by this one who is coming, who's going to break the enmity. The, the one who will be born of a woman will come through your seed, Abraham. And God promised that one day he would send a one, a Messiah, one anointed by him, the, the person anointed by God to provide the fulfillment of the sacrifice for sin, the, the blood sacrifice, who would to people who would commit themselves to living by belief and faith in the Lord like Abraham. The, the, he would be the ultimate seed who would is perfectly righteous and holy in the midst of a world full of nothing but sinners. So the promise has been made. And, we, and, and Abraham knew it would come through his lineage, but Abraham didn't even have, have a son yet. So who was going to save the people who lived in Sodom? Who were they to believe in? Look at the last part of verse 25. Abraham has the audacity to ask God 
Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The Hebrew word translated judge means to exercise the functions of the government. That means judicially, legislatively, and as the chief executive. Hence, this could be this word could also be translated as the rule, the ruler of the earth. Shall not the ruler of the earth do right? The ruler of the earth, Abraham knew was he was looking at him. He was looking at God and human flesh and blood, and he was looking at him, and he knew that he was the only righteous man walking on the face of the earth. Isn't that something? Here's God incarnate right there in front of him. He's the one who's the only righteous man that people can believe in. Here, the title, Judge of the Earth, denoted that the Lord was sovereign over the entire planet. This one who took on human flesh, who is God in flesh and blood. The Lord is the final judge of all men, whether human, natural, or heavenly. Abraham's question here does not imply that he considered it possible for God to issue an unjust ruling. Rather, he, did, he wasn't trying to make a statement like that. Rather, his rhetorical question expressed his struggle to reconcile his faith in God's justice with his own perception of Sodom's punishment and the potential for someone like his nephew Lot to repent and believe and live by faith and still be saved, forgiven and live, still be saved. So we come down to verse 32. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak, but once more, suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of, and, and, and God said, see, it's got a capital H, and God said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. But God's character, in addition to being perfectly just, is also merciful. Praise the Lord, God has mercy and grace. And God says to Abraham, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10 righteous people living in Sodom. 10 people who will repent and believe in me and walk by faith. In fact, when God executed judgment against Sodom, although he prescribed the number of 10 righteous individuals, 10 could not be found. And he still spared the only three people who responded positively to the presence of his two heavenly messengers, the angels who were speaking for him. Okay. God did what he said. Because he found three people who would live by faith in him, who would repent and live by faith in him. Now let's come down to chapter 19 and let's look at verse number one. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. Lot must have risen to a place of some promise, some significant amount of prominence, prominence and respect in Sodom. In ancient Canaanite culture, the king or person in power empowered by the king would sit in the gate of a city and conduct court as the judge over civil and criminal disputes among the people of a surrounding region. Okay, we see that all the way clear into the times of David and after that. Okay, the 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 king or someone he would designate would sit in the gate of the city and speak for the king and 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 negotiate 
disputes between people. And a lot offers then insists upon providing proper and even expected Middle Eastern hospitality to the two angels as they arrive at the gate of the city of Sodom. Now, they haven't told him who they are, but he does have a respect for them almost instantly, uh, being a person who was closer to God. He has a recognition that these men have integrity and they have righteousness, okay? Different from the people of Sodom in general. Okay, we come down to verses four and five. Now, before they lay down, now they come, everybody's gone back to, gone back to Lot's house. They've all had a nice dinner. They've all had a time to visit. And now they're laying down to go to bed. But before they could lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called the lot and said to him, where are the men who came with you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. The text does not discuss what social norms are being broken. The standard of the Mosaic law has not yet been handed down by God. The sin of the Sodomites is self-evident and multi-leveled and blatant and unambiguous, according to John Walton. But there is nothing to define it that is written, okay? There is nothing subtle or secretive about their behavior. No inhibitions interfere with their threats of violence or demands to indulge their lust. The text also makes it clear that the wicked behavior is not isolated. It says all the men of the city, both old and young, all the people from every quarter of the city, it's not just somebody in one section of the city. All are involved in this sexual deviance. Verses six through eight. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him and said, please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have known, uh, not known a man, please let me bring them out to you and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men since this is the reason they have come to my shadow, to the shadow of my roof. Now, Lot's response to the demand of the men is at first to us sounds very startling. Is, is Lot truly offering his daughters to be gang raped and probably murdered? Understanding Lot as a judge over Sodom may help us understand his statement better as biting sarcasm aimed at pricking the conscience of the mob. Uh, John Walton paraphrases Lot's statement like this. I would as soon have you violate my family members as violate those that I have taken in and offered hospitality under my own roof. Walton also offers this understanding. It would be like sarcastically saying to your mortgage company, why don't you just take the clothes off my children's back and the food off their plates? Not like you would ever do that, but saying that if you take all my money, I won't have the money to, to pay for the food or their clothing. Okay, Lot in speaking these words, words is emphatically stating his true intention of never allowing that to ever happen. It's like him saying, not in a million years. There's no way on earth that I would ever let them, let you do that to them. Or saying something like, over my dead body, will you do these things? And uh, 
And so let's let's come down to verse 9. And they said, stand back. Then they said, this one came in to stay here. And he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. And the reaction, this reaction of the crowd confirms that they realized Lot was acting as a judge over the, their morality and in what they, he had said. The crowd reacted with rebellion against Lot's authority as their judge in such matters. The crowd resented that a person like Lot, who was a foreigner, came in to stay there, and he keeps acting as a judge over them in matters of morality. Their rebellion turned to anarchy and violence when they said, stand back. And they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break the door down to the house. Lot at this point is beyond any power to enforce the law or to punish the violators. His ad admonitions have absolutely no teeth any longer. Verses 10 through 11, but the angels inside reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them. You see, they have very powerful strength and they shut the door. And the angels struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. Okay. So now Lot gets to see and everybody in the house gets to see that these, these men have supernatural power to do things that typical people can't do in other words when those men said to back in the in the in verses two and three that well we were planning on sleeping in the town square and lots of that would not be safe for you to sleep in the town square well they could have slept in the town square if they wanted to and nobody was going to bother them there Okay, <laughs> and, and that's what they meant. But but they they knew that that you know they would have to go sl stay with Lot. But they 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 said that you know well we we're going to sleep in town square. Okay, let's come down to verses twelve and thirteen. Then the men said to Lot, "Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons?" Now, the men here is are the angels, okay? So now they're, they're inside with Lot in his house, and these men are the angels, okay? So then the angels said to Lot, have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place, this place meaning the city, for we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Now, let's, let's analyze this just a little bit. In this case, God chose to make his heavenly messengers or angels indistinguishable in their appearance from other men. In other places in the Bible, the person who sees an angel most often falls down in awe, recognizing that the angel has come directly from the presence of God. At the gate of the, there are exempt, there are exceptions to that, but but and oftentimes that the opposite is true. At the gate of the city, Lot seemed to recognize immediately that this men had a connection with God, that they were godly. Okay, it wasn't until they destroyed the displayed their superior power that he realized that they were actually angels sent there by God. The angels then reported to Lot and his family that the Lord himself had told them that the outcry against them and the city of Sodom had grown great. And as recorded in Genesis 18.20, the Lord had told Abraham that Sodom and Gomorrah's punishments could wait no longer because their sin was very grave. Okay, there's that word again. The Hebrew word translated very grave carries the meaning that their sin weighed very heavy on God's holiness. The Hebrew word translated outcry 
could refer to a cry of righteous indignation by other people in the surrounding regions like Canaan or the anguish of those suffering in Sodom and Gomorrah. The term may also point to the wickedness of the cities as if it was shouting to heaven in Genesis 13, 13. Okay, in Genesis 18, 32, in his conversation with the Lord as he was leaving, Abraham had prayed for Sodom, probably because his nephew and his family were living there at the time. Life held no meaning among anyone else in Sodom and Gomorrah except for their selfish pleasure. So much so that the two angels entered the city and Lot had immediately recognized the danger they faced and he persuaded them to immediately take refuge inside his house. In Genesis 18, 21, God will allow no unforgiven sin to go unpunished. That is always true with God, for God is holy. God had, over the previous years, given the peoples of Sodom and Gomorrah a chance to repent. We see this in Genesis 14, 18 through 24, after he had used J Abraham to deliver them from the kings of Mesopotamia. Now, that is where Melchizedek came down from Salem. And, and Abraham had, had fallen down and worshipped Melchizedek, who was God's eternal high priest, okay, and given Melchizedek a, a tithe of all of the all of the booty that he had captured back from the Mesopotamian kings, he had tied the tenth of all of it back to Melchizedek as giving a tithe back to God from all the gifts that God had given him. Okay, The king of Sodom stood right there and saw Abraham do that, and the king of Sodom just made it, did an about face and turned and went back home with all of his stuff. Okay, he had an opportunity to, to worship God there in that place and tithe his, his things that he had received from God also. It was God that gave them the victory. It was God that gave them that money back. And that was what they, the reason they were tithing it. It was, it was because it was God-given. And and so they had he had an opportunity to repent also. And that his army that he had brought had an opportunity, stood right there and had an opportunity to repent, and none of them did. Okay. So I, I want you to see that God had given them the the, the people of Sodom and, and their leaders an opportunity to see Abraham fall down in worship before God and and give a tithe to God, which God accepted, but they did not, okay? And also, I want you to notice that when the angel said to, to Lot, the Lord has sent us to destroy the city, that Hebrew word for destroy is the same word used in Genesis 9-11 when God promises to never destroy the earth again by flood. Every living thing on earth died in that flood except for eight people and some choice animals that were on that boat. Let's come down to verse 14. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters and said, get up. Get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. They probably said, are you joking? Are you kidding? Lot took what the angel said to heart and warned his sons-in-law, saying, the Lord will destroy this city. But Lot said his sons-in-law thought he was joking. Scholars suggest two 
possible interpretations concerning the word sons-in-law. Okay, this is important for the end of the story. It could be that Lot had at least two married daughters in addition to his two unmarried daughters who were in the house. Okay, so if he went, it, it, it leaves this, verse 14 leaves open the possibility he, he went outside after all of the people of Sodom had left and he went to the house of his two sons-in-law. Okay, that, that possibility is there in that wording. Okay, and that could be where his two married daughters were living also. But that would mean that when the destruction comes, his two married daughters got left behind also with their husbands. Okay, don't think that's probably the case. He probably would have wanted them to go with him. I mean, it would have made a bigger plea for that. Okay, now the second possibility turns out probably is the most likely one. This phrase could also indicate that these men were only engaged to his unmarried daughters, okay? They were betrothed with a Middle Eastern betrothal where their fathers had already paid a dowry for Lot's daughters and they were betrothed. They were in the betrothal period where they were considered to be theirs but they would not were not living together yet and not were hopefully engaging in sexual activity yet until the day of the wedding ceremony okay so that sounds like a more likely possibility because these two daughters that were not married yet in in lots makes a statement have not been with a man yet okay are going to leave with Lot and be saved at the end. Okay, I don't want to spoil the end of the story for you, but they are. Okay, <laughs> okay. the Hebrew word translated joking here, where the sons-in-law thought he was joking, is used two other times in the Pentateuch. It, it means a, an offensive, mocking, or lewd revelry. Okay, the one place it's used is going to come later in Genesis 21, 9, where Ishmael, after Isaac is born, and Isaac comes to the place where he is weaned. The, the, traditionally, the, 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 Jew, the, the, the Hebrew people would celebrate when a baby was weaned, and, and as a part of that celebration, they would have a big, a big celebration at that, at that in a party. Well, Ishmael is going to is going to mock that birthday because they're celebrating so much about about Isaac, the baby Isaac, and that's going to get him kicked out of the household. Okay, he's about he'll be about fifteen years old when he does that, and he's going to get kicked out along with his mom when he does that. Okay, that that he, because he's going to be mocking Isaac as being so important so important to them okay the other just the other place where we see this word used is in the israelite celebration when they build the golden calf moses is coming down off the sinai with the with the the tablets of the ten commandments and moses sees them that they built the golden calf and they're worshiping the golden calf with lewd revelry that's the same word they're, the way they're worshiping the golden calf is moses sees them okay and so this is the way the sons-in-law are regarding the the lewd disbelieving mocking way that they're speaking to lot okay about what he's saying Okay, so they were mocking him like the, with this warning, get up and get out of this place. Okay, they're laughing, the statement, a lewd sort of a way. All right, and some Americans laugh at or even worse, disrespect, disrespectfully sneer at statements regarding God's coming judgment against our nation's sinful ways of living. 
especially with respect to people's choice of sinful sexual practices. It's even got a name today. It's called cancel culture. Think about it. And think about the punishment. Okay. Verses 15 and 16. When the morning dawned, the angels earned, urged Lot, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, in the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. At the crack of dawn, the angels urged Lot to get his family and to get out of there soon, lest they be consumed in the punishment of the city. The Hebrew word for consumed can also be translated swept away. It literally means to scrape away, to remove, or to destroy. It carries the picture of heaping something up in a pile and sweeping it away. The word is found again in verse 17. Okay. For emphasis, it's repeated twice. In verse 16, the Hebrew for phrase, he lingered, is translated, he hesitated in the in Christian standard Bible. The angels, the angels perceived that Lot was dragging his feet. He was not moving quickly to get out of there. Lot really didn't want to leave his home in Sodom. He liked it there. He didn't want to leave. And he was kind of going slow and dragging his feet, not really in a hurry to get out of there. And Lot's heart may have become hardened to God's righteous influence by the evil practices that he's with, he had witnessed. Maybe he's thinking, well, it's not that bad. We can stand it here and some of the angels then grabbed him by the hand and grabbed his wife hand hand and the other angel grabbed that the hand of one of his daughters and, and the hand of his other daughter and they drug him out of the house right now not don't take anything don't carry anything get out of here okay <laughs> Christian Standard Bible ad, adds, this is because of the Lord's compassion to emphasize that Lot and his family would have been killed along with the rest of the city of the whole, all of the people in Sodom, except that the Lord in his merciful compassion had intervened on their behalf. This is a great illustration of God's grace shown to every one of us. who will repent of our sins to God and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and commit our living daily to faith in his direction going forward every day. We need to see that connection out of this story. Let's go to verse 17. So it came to pass when they brought them outside that the angel said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you or stay anywhere on the plain. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. The Hebrew phrase escape for your life is translated in the New Christian Standard Bible, run for your life. Run. We can assume from the context that the person speaking these commands is one of the two angels. The, the verb translated escape or run is, now this is important, it's translating right out of the Hebrew. The verb translated escape or run is masculine singular imperative. Okay. Meaning, that the angel was giving orders, since it's masculine, he's the only guy that's going with the angels, 
He was giving orders specifically to Lot. He's saying, lead your wife and your daughters to safety. Okay. And he's giving instructions to Lot. And he gives two instructions. He says, here's the two instructions that they all, you need to follow. Okay. The words you, your, and life are both masculine and singular meaning that the angel was at this point placing the responsibility for the lives of, of all five of them in Lot's hands. They're on Lot's shoulders. Then the angels commanded them with two instructions. Number one, do not look behind you nor stay anywhere on the plane, lest you you be destroyed. Okay, that's the first instruction. Don't look back and do not stay on the plane lest you be destroyed. Instruction number two, escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. Now, God remembered Abraham's prayer and decided to show mercy to Lot and his family. They were forewarned with those two instructions and hurried out of the city. Were reluctant though they were, that morning, right at sunup, they were they were literally dragged out of the city by the by the angels. The Lord, being merciful, denotes His mercy in delivering Lot and his immediate family, his wife and his two daughters. Okay, so there's four of them. I'm not five. Okay, Lot and his his wife and his two daughters. Okay, so there's four. I can't count. Okay, and so God is being merciful and compassionate with them. Okay, even though they don't, they're being reluctant to even leave. So now we come down to verse 18 through 20. Then Lot said to them, please, no, my lords, indeed, now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life, but I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil or overtake me and I die. See, now, this city is near enough to flee to, and is a little one. Uh, Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one and my soul shall live? Well, the angel was warning Lot that the only place of safety at the time was going to be in the mountains. To stay anywhere in the plain or the valley of Sidim would have exposed Lot and his family to the zone of destruction, being meted out under God's judgment. It is very likely that Lot did not fully comprehend what was about to happen, but he was so attached to the city and the plain that he said to them, please, no, my Lord, please, no, my Lord. Lot recognized the mercy shown to him by God through the angels, saying, indeed, now your servant has found favor, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But now Lot decided to negotiate with the Lord at the last second. I mean, when they were literally clicking the seconds down until all of this was going to be destroyed, that everything that they were standing on was going to be destroyed. He wants to go to Zoar, which is just a little town at the edge of the plain, but still in the valley. Okay. It's still in the valley of Sidim. The town's name actually means small. Okay, that's the reason he says, is it not a little one? Okay, its name means small. Okay, that's that's how the angel knew it was Zoar. The one that means small, the one that is small. We are told in God's word, flee from your youthful lust before God's judgment. 2 Timothy 2.22. In Genesis 14 two through eight, we're told that Zoar is associated, is right next door to the larger town, Bela, which, B-E-L-A, which is also intended for destruction in Genesis 14, two and 
Genesis 14, 8. Okay. Lot was willing to risk standing literally one step away from destruction. He wants to live in Zoar while Belah is being destroyed. And they are literally like two towns that touch each other. Okay. By law being bigger. And he says, well, can I just stay in the littler one? Yeah. Why we do things and why we argue things with the Lord is hard to understand. Uh, we all do it, though. We all do it sometimes. So it's not the angel that can give him an answer. Okay. All of these things are decided by God. And the angel knew that, okay? It was up to the Lord to make that decision, okay? And he knew that. And so in verses 21 and 22, we read, and the angel said to him, see, I, he quotes God, okay? He quotes God. The angel quotes God. See, I have favored you concerning this thing also in that I will not overthrow this city for which I, for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city is called Zoar, the little city. Okay. So go to the little city, but you need to get there because I can't start this destruction until you are there. Okay, so the, the phrase, see, I have favored you concerning this thing also is difficult to translate from English. From Christian Standard Bible, that phrase reads, all right, I'll grant your request about this matter too. God granted his grace and mercy in his reply through the angel. The, this also serves as an answer to Abraham's prayer. Abraham had prayed that God would spare the wicked for the sake of a few righteous ones. This is fulfilled sparing Zoar so that Lot would be spared as well. The Hebrew word translated overthrow, where God says, I will spare it and not overthrow it, okay, can also be translated demolish or destroy. The term speaks of total annihilation. While Sodom and other cities marked by God for destruction would experience total annihilation, God promised Lot that he would not harm Zoar. Once that was decided by the Lord, the angel decided, ch changed his second command to hurry, escape them. The angel added, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. In response to Abraham, Abraham's prayer, Lot was being protected by God's angels. And they were being temporarily interrupted by God's, by Lot's hesitation. Okay. You, this, the, the, the angels knew this was all coming down no matter what. God was going to bring it down. And really, this is all under God's control. Okay, it's not their control. Okay, so they're getting nervous. Okay, and they're saying they're they're responsible for Lot, and and those and those 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 other three people. Okay, and they're and so they're they're saying we got to do we got to do this fast. Whatever we do, we got to do it fast. And let's come down to verse twenty three. The sun had risen upon the earth. Now, what that means is they left the house first thing in the morning. Okay, right at sun up. Okay, now this means that the sun is is it's noon. It's the sun straight up. The running earth, the sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Okay, so now it's noon. It's high noon. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. When the sun had risen, then the Lord rained fire and brimstone. There's key phrases here that we want to look at. Okay, let's look at those. I got them underlined here. The sun had risen. It indicates 
that it was approximately 24 hours after God and the two angels had left Abraham's and Sarah's tent at noon of the day before. Okay. And now they're 24 hours later. You know, remember Abraham had left with them and walked with them until, until God departed. Okay. And then he turned around and went back home. Okay, the second phrase is out of the heavens. In the New King James, it's translated out of the sky. In the Christian Standard Bible, this is describing the outpouring of the brimstone and fire as it's translated in the New King James or the burning sulfur in the Christian Standard Bible, which echoes the devastating rain from the sky in Noah's flood. Noah's flood, it was rain that destroyed all life except for what was on the ark. Okay, here it is burning sulfur or fire and brimstone. Now, <clears throat> well, let's let's just let's just move on. Uh, the it's well known that there were tar pits that covered the landscape around this region, the, around the valley of Sidim, Genesis fourteen ten. Okay, these tar pits are sulfur. Uh, there's sulfur in it, and it's this this hydrocarbon with sulf mixed with sulfur that is explosive, and and can burn it can actually ignite and explode okay and that's probably what this reference to burning sulfur is is the the terrible smell and smoke that comes off of this tar as it is ignited the repetition though of notice the repetition of then the lord and from the lord on each end of the raining brimstone and fire or raining uh, burning sulfur. Okay. The uh, then the Lord and from the Lord is clear in stating that this was an act of judgment sent by and brought by God on the wickedness of people in a specific region of the world as opposed to the flood of Noah that destroyed life over the entire globe except those protected in, in Noah's Ark. The, the repetitious statement indicates that God was indeed the source of the judgment and he was the source of the rain of burning sulfur that was pouring, outpouring of his wrath upon a specific group of people, Sodom and Gomorrah and those cities and the other cities, because of their wickedness, their pride, and their arrogance. Now, numerous attempts have been made to explain with natural causes these fires from the sky. Like I said, these, these these tar pits are well known in this region. In fact, there's still many are still there today. Uh, some speculate that light a lightning storm set these tar pits ablaze and created a wildfire fire that spread across the region. Uh, others attribute the destruction to severe earthquake in the region. Still others point to the significance of uh, volcanic activity in southeastern Syria. Uh, uh, but in any and all of these scenarios, the naturally occurring phenomenon have each been put in place by God Almighty, El Shaddai, according to his eternal purpose and plan and his direction. He put each one of these things where they are located. He moved them according to his will and his plan and his time. In verse 25, the Hebrew word overthrew is hafak, which means to cause ruin as an extension of flipping over an object. As the, as the extensive shaking of the ground in an earthquake crumbles the ground and the buildings in a city. Okay, so there, 
this this may indicate that there was a, a, a tremendous earthquake that went along with this. Okay. In verse 25, it says, God overthrew the city. The Hebrew word overthrew means total annihilation. Okay. There were five cities that were destroyed. Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bala. Zoar was spared. Okay. Modern, modern archaeology and geology agree very closely with the biblical account. And, uh, and I'll let you read about that later. Uh, in verse 25, it says, So he overthrew, he annihilated all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. Now, I want to I want to show you a, but before I go there, I want to tell you one last thing because I'm going to show you some maps and talk to you about him overthrowing those three things. Verse 26. But Lot's wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Remember. The first command that God gave through the angel to them as they began to run towards Zoar, he said, don't look back. Don't look back. And then he said, at first he said, run into the mountains, but then he gave them permission to run to Zoar for the second command. But the first command is still in place. He says, if you do either one of these, you'll be destroyed. Okay. Lot's wife forgot the, 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 the first commandment given to them by the angels as they parted ways. That morning. They were just about to the top of the cusp of the Valley of Sidene to safety. And she, I guess, probably when the, when the fire and the brimstone just broke out, she looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And Lot lived the rest of his life without the mother of his two daughters. So I want to show you a couple of pictures since it does imply in the text that there was an earthquake. Uh, that we can, we can look at. Ge geologists have looked at this and there's a very interesting thing that we see here. It says, in verse 25, that he overthrew those cities, or he, did, he annihilated those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and, and what grew on the ground. Well, the what grew on the ground, if you look, ever heard anything about the Dead Sea, is the Dead Sea today is this huge sea, uh, which is, is the Dead Sea is the lowest spot on earth that is not in the ocean okay it is it is far below sea level and it is has such deep salinity in the water that nothing lives in it except for some very unique bacteria can survive in that, that so, so very salty water. And they, they know why it's salty. Okay, I'm going to show you that. And, uh, but it also has made salty all of the shorelines around it and all of that because of the wind that's blown the salt out on all of the, all the banks and all of the, all of the, all the hills that are around it, all of them are dead also. Nothing grows in that region. It is dead. All of the, all of the, all that grew on the ground is dead in that area. Okay. Okay. And here's, here's what we do know. This is a, this is a, a relief map that shows the, the area of the, 
of the path of the original path of the the Jordan River. They came down and cut a gorge all the way through the this wide area is the is the area of the Dead Sea right here. Then it comes on down and there's this this is the original gorge of the Dead Sea before uh, or, uh, of the Jordan River before the Dead Sea came into place and it the Dead Sea the Jordan River used to flow on down into the Gulf of Aqaba which is where it turns blue here okay and so what I want you to look at here in this map is there are actually two fault lines here. One is the fault line right here in the Red Sea that divides the, is the fault line between the African continent and the Asian continent. And it is a fault line that is a, a vertically moving fault line. Okay, it is, it is, it is moving vertically up and down and it is also moving laterally Red Sea is getting is getting wider all the time. So this is opening up. See the arrows? It's opening up, and it's also moving vertically. All right. <clears throat> now there's another fault line that begins <clears throat> begins right here at the Gulf of Aqaba that runs up the Gulf of Aqaba on into the a uh, gorge cut by the Jordan River all the way through the Dead Sea, all the way through the Sea of Galilee, all the way up into Syria, and all the way up to uh, Turkey. And this is the fault line between the Arabian plate and the and the the Gulf or the uh, Sinai Peninsula plate, okay, and the Canaan plate. And this plate is a plate that moves that moves horizontally. See, see the how the lines are drawn. This plate moves north and this plate moves south. Okay. But also as this plate is moving up and down and right and left, it also can is ripping apart and making larger the Gulf of Aqaba just because of this movement is ripping and tearing here and can also bring earthquake activity all along this. So this really makes this fault line two fault lines. It's this one that's here between these two plates and also makes it a second fault line that runs along with this one. Okay, so there's two fault lines that they're acting in conjunction. <coughs> I'll show you that on the next picture. Here's the next picture. This is a cross section of the current Dead Sea. Okay, these are the these are the sedimentary layers of the various ages of sediment. Okay. And you can see them all here. Here's the, here's this, this sedimentary layer. This one right here corresponds to this one right over here on the other side. This one corresponds to this one on the other side. This one right here corresponds to this one on the other side. As you can see, they don't line up with each other in terms of elevation. And then this one right here, see this, this Sinonian layer, it matches up with this one up here on the top to the east, and this one up here on the top to the west. But look how much lower this one is. This is how the Dead Sea got created during this catastrophe that was brought on by God. The these two, there are two fault lines. Here's a fault line right here. See, it says fault here, fault one, and fault two. There's a fault line right here and a fault line right here. The Dead Sea was produced between these two fault lines when this section of 
land dropped down out of between these two sections. I want this was a plane before this all this happened. This was a plane right here went straight across between between here and here. See that? And this dropped, but this part that is now the bed of the Dead Sea dropped even more and created the giant gorge which formed the Dead Sea. And then at the same time, it opened up a salt dome, a giant salt dome that was right in, in this area. It opened us, it exposed the salt dome that stuck up into the area that began to be filled, this low spot that began to be filled by the water of the Jordan Rivers it poured in this area and all of that water began to dissolve that salt dome. This salt dome is still evidenced uh, it, as, as they go in and, and, uh, and run uh, sonars and and uh, and take core samples and things like that they they still can see that salt dome is still sitting there in the bottom of the Jordan River uh, Dead Sea and still making the water salty as it comes in there and it's dissolving in, into that water still there it's not gone yet and and so eventually it may dissolve away it depends on how deep it goes down into the ground here and um, and that's what's making the water salty. But this was an earthquake, and that's what when the, this all dropped at the same time as all these other things happened, as the things were coming, as the fire and brimstone was coming out of the sky, this earthquake came, and, and the and the whole area that was the plain, this was the plain right here, and it dropped down, uh, and then this section dropped down a little bit on the on the west side but not near as much as 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 the bed of the dead sea dropped so i just wanted you to be able to see uh, with your own eyes how this all happened and uh so i'm going to go ahead and, and let you read the rest of this so uh, you know if you if you don't have time to watch it right now this uh you bring it back up uh, on youtube and Watch the rest later if you don't have time. But this is good stuff to, to see, think about. Verses 27 and 28. And Abraham went out early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord and then looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw and behold the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And the smoke that he saw was over what the the area that was called the plain. In the map that I showed you, the hand drawn map that I showed showed you earlier. Verse thirty. Then Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountains. Well, he originally went to Zoar just like he asked, but he. For some reason, I guess because it was just too close to the destruction, he decided that he was going to go up in the mountains after all. Maybe God's advice seemed pretty good to him because this says that he actually went up and dwelt in the mountains. And his two daughters were with him for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar. Okay? So it's telling me he was afraid to live there. And he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. So they made a a nice home for themselves in a cave in the mountains. Now, the firstborn, we don't know how much time's elapsed. They may have lived in this cave for a long time. We we don't know. So there may be a time, time gap here. Now, the firstborn said to the younger, our father is old, and there's no man on the earth to come in to us, as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, 
And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. It happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, and you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus, the daughters of Lot were, the, were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab, and he is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami, and he is the father of the people of Ammon, or the Ammonites, to this day. And that's the end. Uh, so the, the Moabites and the Ammonites thereby came through Lot's lineage. And two more nations come through the family of Abraham. Let's pray. Father, we praise your name. Lord, we, we understand your will from these words. We understand your almighty strength and power. We understand your holiness. Lord, we understand that we should humble ourselves before you at all times because you do show us grace each and every day. And we thank you, Lord, for the grace that you show us, your willingness to forgive us when we repent and we turn away from our sin, and we walk in faith in you. But Lord, we also need to understand that you also are a God of justice as well, and that because of your holiness, you must judge unforgiven sin. And Lord, we this judgment is, is coming, in each and every case where sin is not forgiven. And, and Lord, we we ask that we can un be understanding of that timeless truth, and that part of your holiness that must be fulfilled. And, and Lord, we need to be careful as, as believers that we are repentant of our sins, that we have a, a heart that is that is softened to your will and we are touched by our sin and we are regretful of our sin and we repent of our sin and we turn back to you and walk with you in your way and each and every time. Lord, help us to do your will in all things. Lord, uh, help us to see our sin when it occurs. Lord, guide us uh, so that we understand when our thoughts are moving in sinful ways so that we can avoid our sin. And, and Lord, help us always to do things your way and to do your will. Lord, we thank you for this story. Uh, it touches our hearts. It, it makes us fearful. But at the same time, Lord, it, it makes us thankful for you and your grace. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's good to see you guys. Hope to see you uh, next week. Same time, same place. Bye-bye.